Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Emma Belcher and I'm the incoming president of the Ploughshares Fund. Thank you for joining us for this afternoon's program, the dawn of the nuclear age, 75 years after Hiroshima. So 75 years have passed since the United States dropped uh, atomic bombs on the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in the waning days of World War II. These cities stand as a powerful symbol of nuclear destruction that have shaped how we think about war, peace, power, and ethics. Today, we convene to mark the 75th anniversary and reflect on this historic event and lives lost. We reflect on the importance of reporting truth to the world and the prospect of a future free of nuclear weapons. Before we start the conversation, please note that the Council is an independent and non-partisan membership organisation. We're on the record today and the views expressed by individuals we host are their own. They do not represent institutional positions or views of the Council. After the moderate discuss moderated discussion, I'll incorporate your questions. So please turn your browsers to ccga.live to submit a question or vote for questions that you like. It is now my great pleasure to introduce our speakers today. We have Leslie M. M. Bloom. She's an award-winning journalist, historian, and New York Times best-selling author. She's just completed her 12th book to mark the 75th anniversary of the atomic bombing of Hiroshima. And we also have Rachel Bronson. She's the president and CEO of the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. Leslie's new book, Fallout, The Hiroshima Cover-Up and the Reporter Who Revealed It to the World, is available for sale by a bookseller, and you can find a link to purchase the book on the event page on the Council's website. Okay, so let's dive in. Um, Leslie, you've written a terrific book um, that has just come out. Um, and in it, um, you write about John Hersey and the um, uh, article um, that he wrote for um, the New Yorker magazine. And it reflects on six stories um, of people after the uh, bombing of Hiroshima. Um, and I have to say that I've read um, uh, Hiroshima and I think it's really absolute must reading for anybody who's listening to this call and is interested in understanding uh, nuclear weapons and just understanding our history and uh, reflecting on Hiroshima on this really important day. Um, and um, in it, um, you actually quote uh, John Hersey at the beginning and he, saying what has kept the world safe from the bomb since 1945 has been the memory of what happened at Hiroshima. And this is really, really powerful. Um, and what I'd like to sort of start off with first is, you know, what drove you to want to report on the story of John Hersey and his New Yorker magazine article? You know, he wrote the article um, and it was really profound and um, impactful. And what is it about him and his story that interested you to write a book about it? Well, look, I mean, I, I came at the topic as a journalist covering another journalist, not as a, an, an expert in, you know, nuclear policy or even you know, nuclear history. Um, but, you know, to be totally honest, it, it, as, a, as a journalist and as the daughter of a journalist and as the wife of a journalist, I mean, this is my community and I have felt very upset, to say the least, over the unprecedented assault on our free press over the last four years. And I wanted to be able to find a historical newsroom narrative, nonfiction narrative that would really remind American readers about the crucialness of the American press um, and the grave importance of independent investigative reporting and holding the powerful to account and also giving voices to people who cannot speak for themselves anymore. I knew I wanted it to be a World War II narrative also, and eventually, you know, I, I knew the broad strokes of Hersey's story, but one only ever hears about, you know, how successful it was, and nobody had ever approached the, the logistics of the story. How, how on earth did he get the story in the first place? Um, and, you know, for me as a, as a journalist, I mean, I started as a production coordinator in Ted Koppel's newsroom. You know that it's, it's always a question of logistics. Whoever controls the ground controls the story. So the more I investigated the story and I realized what Hersey had actually been up against uh, to get the story of these six 
regular folks, these individuals who were among the only humans who had ever been on the receiving end of nuclear warfare, what he had to do to get it the, and the obstacles were so significant that I, I knew that there was a big story there and, and I dove in. Yeah, terrific, terrific. So um, uh, can you give us a little bit um, of, a, of a summary of sort of what you found overall, just a, a couple of couple of a snippet, a snippet yeah. summary. Yeah. Well, I mean, look, I, I, I thought that it was really just going to be um, a story of finding out how Hersey got in, um, you know, without MacArthur knowing and, you know, doing his reporting and getting out. And it turned out not to be the case at all. It, you know, it turned out that MacArthur um, had in, and his uh, apparatus called SCAP had enormous control over Japan, more or less from day one of occupation and had corralled Japanese press and um, the foreign press, um, especially on the topic of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, because um, they didn't want to be seen, the America didn't want to be seen as, quote, having done outdone Hitler and atrocities. Um, and so what I, what I learned is that not only was Hersey humanizing what had happened at Hiroshima in his, in his deeply important work, but he was also revealing the extent to which the U.S. had covered up the handiwork of its then experimental weapons in the atomic cities. Wow. Uh, well, we're definitely uh, in uh, a very different world today than we were 75 years ago um, since uh, Hiroshima. Um, I'd like to actually um, bring in Rachel uh, now to um, ask, you know, um, Rachel, you are the uh, leader of the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, um, which has the iconic doomsday clock. And according to the clock, we are 100 seconds to midnight. Um, which is is very daunting, and I believe the closest we've been to midnight um, uh, in in the uh, clock's history. How did we get here? And 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 um, you know, how is it that seventy five years after the dropping of the atomic uh, bombs, we are in this position? Thank you, Emma, and I'm delighted to be here with you and Leslie. I feel like I could be the interviewer and would be very comfortable there. Um, um, one of the links to what, uh, to, to what Leslie's saying too, just at the bulletin is that, um, I just, I, I want to start the bulletin was founded by Manhattan project scientists who wanted to get the word out about this dangerous and destructive weapon that they had helped create. Um, and they knew that they needed the media and they knew they needed to get the word out through mag. So they created a magazine to do that. They created a, a platform. And I, I hadn't really thought of the, the link between what inspired Leslie to, to write the book and where our, my, the founders of my organization were in terms of like how to engage the public. Um, and in 1945, it was through a bulletin. In 1947, it was through a magazine and, and John Hersey doing it through uh, the New Yorker and, and that magazine. It's kind of a fascinating interweaving of stories. Um, and and how, you, how we got here, just for the landscape to kind of put out where we are on this 75th anniversary, is we did move the doomsday clock uh, in January to 100 seconds to midnight. That's the closest it's ever been. The closest before that was two minutes to midnight, which had been in the two years prior. But before that, it hadn't been since 1953. So to kind of bookend where we are, right, where we in my organization believe we are is... In 1947, when the doomsday clock was created, it was set at seven minutes to midnight. And it was done um, recognizing that the, the scientists who were, had been working on these issues really believed that if we didn't create the right policies around this technology, we would end humanity uh, uh, as humanity, full stop. Um, they saw where where technology was going. And sure enough, when the, the Soviets tested their bomb uh, in 1949, we moved it closer to midnight. And then in 1953, it was moved uh, when both the U.S. and the Soviets had exploded the um, a hydrogen bomb, right, thermonuclear war, which was uh, ultimately a thousand times more powerful than the bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And so quickly after the technology was moving so quickly. And... What I think is useful for our organization, for our audience right now, is back in those early days, if you characterize the landscape, we had 
no arms control yet, right? We had we were just really at the beginnings of all this, so the the whole architecture of arms control wasn't put in place. We had a clear techn uh, tech focus on technology to outdo the Soviets, and we were willing to spend huge amounts of money to go into these arsenals. Fast forward, or let me. So if you look at the the, the landscape that we're in, I think you can reasonably say from 1945 to 1970, we had a period of kind of unabashed arm race. From 1970 to 2010, you can say it was the golden age of arms control. There was challenges, it was dangerous, but we were building an architecture that we would have some communication with uh, the, between the US and the Soviets, um, and also a, a way to try to reduce the levels. But between 2010, and we can get into the days of 2010 and today, we have what's clearly the ripping out of the roots of, of arms control. The last remaining arms control agreement between the United States and now Russia is set to expire, as you well know, in January of 2021, the last remaining arms control agreement. Technology is moving very fast. We can talk about that, but in terms of hypersonic uh, technologies and missiles, in terms of artificial intelligence and cyber, in, in the interweaving of cyber and what that means for security, and a huge investment being made by every major nuclear power, the Chinese and the Russians for sure. The US is about to embark on a $1.7 trillion investment in their arms control in their um, nuclear arsenals. So the, what characterized those early periods when we were at seven, five, three, two minutes to midnight, it's very similar to now. And yet we do not have the public awareness, which is, what Leslie is, has written about so well, we're not close to it anymore. So we have all of the problems without the public attention and engagement, which leads us to move it for a variety of reasons, but to move it from two minutes to 100 seconds to midnight. Great. Thank you. Um, and so I think if I can sort of return then, um, given the situation we're in today, um, let me just return to, to Leslie and I'm going to repeat the quote that I um, read earlier from John Hersey and then ask a question. Um, so he said, what has kept the world safe from the bombs since 1945? It's been the memory of what happened at Hiroshima. And so Leslie, you know, what kind of effect do you think um, Hiroshima has had with respect to um, preventing the use of uh, a nuclear weapon since then? Um, and, you know, has it served as a deterrent? Um, what, if anything, any kind of role has John Hersey's and other reporting had in um, bringing uh, awareness of the devastating impacts of um, or consequences of nuclear weapons? Um, you know, what role has that, if anything, played in the fact that we haven't had another nuclear um, detonation uh, since then, or a nuclear use of nuclear weapon in, in, in war since then? Well, I mean, if I could take it back to what Emma, uh, I'm sorry, what uh, Rachel was talking about two seconds ago, I mean, that, that environment, the landscape of indifference, um, apathy, and just lack of knowledge right now in the public, you know, that existed to a certain extent in 1945 and 1946 also. I mean, the public... Um, had what I call in the book, atro had atrocity fatigue. I mean, they had just lived through the deadliest conflict in, in what remains the deadliest conflict in human history. And um, so in addition to having had the information environment suppressed in terms of, you know, the real news and information about the true aftermath and nature of the bombs, they were also, you know, the public, American public anyway, was emotionally invested in moving on from that as an atrocity, moving on from the conflict, and it really created a landscape comparable to what we're facing right now, where, you know, our, our you know, populace was not engaged in the question, as strongly engaged as they, as they should have been, um, in what, do, what does it mean to have nuclear weapons as a, a part of reality in our world um, and really you know a population that wasn't facing up to the fact that this could spell the end of human civilization um, especially as you know it, um, think technologies were advancing so quickly then as Rachel said um, so for for John Hersey who again was a a journalist uh, he was a seasoned war correspondent although quite young when he um, went into Hiroshima and was determined to report on the human toll there. One of his goals was to 
attack that apathy and to make not just American readers, but global readers uh, feel what it was like to be, you know, on the receiving end of nuclear attack. And that once readers had that level of empathy and they understood the reality of those weapons, that they could not be apathetic in the public debate about them and that they would hold their leaders again to account in terms of the decision making they were making about the role that those weapons would play in our lives going forward. John Hersey did believe, uh, you know, later in his life that Hiroshima's, the, the horribleness of his reporting and the, the horrors of the testimonies of the, um, the blast survivors did contribute to deterrence because um, leadership, nuclear leadership was no longer able to, to portray the weapons in conventional terms. Um, you know, that, that full knowledge then was out in the world about, you know, what, what these bombs really were. Um, and that it would make it harder for leaders to justify to their populations using them as they would use conventional weapons in warfare. He did worry by the 1980s um, that the memory of Hiroshima was growing dim and therefore it was losing its potency as a, as a deterrence. And I would say that um, he would have significantly greater cause to be worried in today's landscape than even in the 1980s. Yeah, great. And so how then, given his intention of uh, writing um, Hiroshima and um, releasing it and raising public awareness, how was it received in the United States? And um, were there different sort of reactions or responses to it? Well, I mean, the public, I guess. Yeah. Well, I mean, among the, the public and the government, I mean, look, it was a hugely risky story to research and put out for, you know, for quite a few reasons. I mean, first of all, he was about to confront, um, you know, most Americans were, were not against the bombings because they really had no idea what what the bombings were, what they had wrought. And um, there was what one of Hersey's contemporary described as a very Fourth of July attitude um, in this country about about the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, and so he was about to. Oh, and it, then in August of 1945, when they uh, there was a survey of, of um, Americans and. Um, 20, close to 25% of those surveyed said that they had wished that many more of the bombs could have been dropped on Japan before uh, Japan had surrendered. So he was confronting Americans over that attitude. He was also um, humanizing Japanese victims, which was going to be enormously controversial. And he was also going to be revealing how much the US government, again, had kept from the American public and the world about the true nature of their uh, experimental mega weapons. Um, so it was, uh, in, again, enormously challenge, challenging for him, but, and it wasn't a foregone conclusion that it was going to be as well received as it was, but um, the effect was enormously successful. Uh, it was, um, I, it's hard to overstate how much of a, how much of a reaction, a good reaction Americans had. Um, the newspaper, newspapers across the country syndicated um, this 30,000 word article um, in spades in all different uh, geographies of the country. Uh, globally, it was syndicated. ABC read it in its entirety um, over four nights. BBC read it in its entirety. Al um, Albert Einstein requested a thousand copies of it to send out to uh, what we would call today influencers. Um, and it, again, it was not a foregone conclusion that it would have gone this well. Um, the government, on the other hand, had a, had a less cheerful reaction to this reporting. Right. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, so then, Rachel, um, how do you think we're in a position now, 75 years later, where a nuclear weapon hasn't been used in war since then? Um, you know, and, and what sort of impact do you think raising public awareness had at different points um, in the history um, to potentially um, prevent uh, nuclear use? You know, um Jerry Brown is our executive chair, and he gave a speech at the, uh, at the bulletin a few years ago um, where he said, like, I'm an ally. I care about these issues. He's out now evangelizing uh, for pay paying more attention to the nuclear issue. But he was governor at the time, and he said, even I can't do as much as I want to do unless my voters are asking me to do that. And he's like, I need you to help get my voters to ask me to care about this. And um, the Union of Concerned Scientists hosted an event that we, we joined in and we had um, uh, members of Congress, Jan Schakowsky was there. She said the same thing. She's like, no, I'm not getting anyone ringing on my phone 
Um, and so uh, I want to care, but, but it's hard. So I think public engagement on this issue matters a lot. It's, we're seeing that on the climate in the climate issues, you can see how just the groundswell of concern is driving uh, political parties across the globe to, to build it into their discussions. Um, and it's not so much on the nuclear side and, and, and because we've been at it for 75 years. Um, so I do think public um, engagement sessions like this matter. And I think we're at this wildly important juncture right now. For much of the time, these issues, they take a long time, they're baked in, the builds up goes on for years. But right now, right now, we are on the cusp of investing $1.7 trillion over the next 30 years in our nuclear arsenal. We must be asking our decision makers, our leaders, if that's really the right way to be spending it, do we really need a $780 billion defense bill with, the, all, with money in it going to nuclear? How are we spending it? I think that, that this moment is a time to really get engaged. And I think what we're seeing, and I'll speak here for the United States, but what we're seeing at this moment with COVID, that's global, but also the race riots, the injustice and equity and DEI, um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. What I think is clear is we are not investing for 21st century challenges. I think COVID brings that home, but we are not investing here in 20, we are mindlessly investing in 20th century threats, right? So former Secretary of Defense Bill Perry talks about, do we really need ICBMs? We're not even having that debate why aren't we having, why invest in them? We thought that was a good idea, you know, in the 20th century. Is that where we should, be, with all the threats we're facing now that need attention, with all the technology. So I think we're in a moment where we can be asking the big questions about budget, the real questions about what's, what, what's going to keep us safe and what are our threats, and forcing our leaders. So I really believe that we still need to kind of stay at this. Uh, this is the ground game, but this is where this all matters. And so sessions like this, Leslie's book, the conversations that are happening today are really important. Yeah. If I could leap in, Rachel, I mean, I think, again, this is a totally compar comparable crux point to what we were seeing in 1946, um, where it, the, the debate was starting to evolve about you know what role should nuclear weapons play should they should they exist and it, I think it in, then as now it comes down to in American the American public attitude is going to come down to well if they have it don't we need it and you know so much you know that was so much of the mentality that drove the the, the push off of the Cold War anyway you know when you look at General Leslie Groves and you know he he's it, in anticipation of um, America no longer having the American monopoly on, uh, on nuclear weapons, you know, he would insist we are going to need the biggest, the most, and the best. Um, and I could see that, I mean, that's what the mentality is right now also. Um, and, you know, we're hearing that in our but very irresponsible leadership that you know we're in a we're, we're going to be in a competition again, and if the Russians have it, if the Russians have this technology, we need to have bigger, better, and more than they do. And so it, I, I, it's another spiral moment or a moment of potential spiraling, in my opinion. And what's so mind um, numbing about that? I mean, that's what an arms race is, and yet we know the reason the Russians have invested, are investing the way they are in their nuclear weapons, is they're a very weak state without a lot of um, alternatives. We in the United States of America have many other alternatives of ways to invest to counter their weapons. And it, it's just a mind numbing response, exactly, Leslie, as you're saying, which is they have it, don't we? And it, and it sells, that's a headline. You can see what they have. We need the exact same thing. But really, is that the really the strategic approach with how advanced we are in cyber and AI and you, that this is the only way we can counter? We know that's not. And we know there's better ways to counter this. We don't need the kind of arsenal that we're building to counter 
the Russians, but that's, that's the only thing they have to counter us. And so you're a hundred percent right on it. It's that's what an arms race looks like. They have it. So we need to build stronger that we build stronger. They see that and they have to do it. But I do believe we in the United States could decide not to follow that path because we do have more options than most of our potential adversaries. Well, it's, you know, then and now it's about, it was, it's about selling fear and, you know, in, in propelling the arms race. And I, and I agree with you. And I think that the message of, you know, us having options, I mean, the public doesn't realize that we have options and the way to undercut the fear um, of being um, outdone or you know, by, by, you know, our nuclear competitors around the world is, is to educate on that score and to make people realize, and to make Americans realize the advantages that we do have and the, the uh, alternatives. So if we talk about this really important need to have these critical conversations and to have them at a scale that is not just um, some experts talking to each other, um, but really to try to bring in um, the public more generally, um, how, how can we do this? Um, and I'm going to sort of go now to some um, audience questions because there's one question that really hits on this um, very nicely. Um, you know, how can we replicate Percy's effect today in a world that is constantly inundated by social media? How can someone break through the noise? Now, presumably, we don't want to have to have another Hiroshima for people to then pay attention um, and sort of become outraged and have the kinds of discussions um, that we need to have now. So how do we do this, given that there's so much going on, there's so much complexity, how do we kind of break through and generate the kind of conversation that um, is so needed today? It's enormously challenging. And, you know, I, I have thought a lot about what it would be like if John Hersey released his report in today, into today's landscape. And I mean, how many people would have dismissed it as fake news? I mean, the, the, the temptation of, you know, just dismissing anything that we find inconvenient, any inconvenient truth as fake news. I mean, it's, it's in it's you must conclude that that's would, would be one of the reactions you know to that kind of um report i mean i feel like we are still seeing some really fine reporting that is breaking through whether it's you know the reporting in the new york times in new york or on me too or reporting in new york magazine on climate change once in a while something really penetrating does get through it does um have an impact i mean but not it, nothing in has had the, the kind of impact no journalism that I can think of has ever really had the impact that um, Hersey's Hiroshima has, but it still gives us a template as journalists um, and experts to to use in trying to drive um, forward awareness on these issues. You know, I will say also, look, you know, again, Hersey's readers in 1946, as I you know keep saying, they, they were totally exhausted, you know, fatigued by catastrophe, and I you know we're at a global moment right now where we are fatigued with catastrophe, and we are facing not one but two immediate existential threats, right? You know, the pandemic and climate change, um, and I think you know that the the public appetite or ability to take on one more global existential threat in this moment may be limited, but it, there must be some way that we can harness the same, same forces, the same attitude, the same enthusiasms, the same um, level of energy that um, younger generations have, have used when addressing climate change as an issue and applying to, it to this issue and really educating younger generations as to the reality of this threat as being, you know, an extremely um, relevant and urgent threat also. I think that might help in terms of, again, breaking through the cacophony. And Rachel, I think, you, yeah, I, I think, um, you know, I do, again, think we're at a moment that is different than a few years ago, you know, Emma, when we were working on, on this, that, that it, it, it really did seem uh, an issue of the Cold War. But we've just lived through 2017, right, where we were really at a nice edge with the North Koreans around nuclear weapons. Um, you know, my kids are, are 14 and 19. That They were like, they were talking about it. Now, obviously, they growing up in this weird household, but, but, <laughs> but their friends were talking about it. This was, you know, this was scary. And then I was on a, a panel this morning out of Hawaii, and they were rem remembering the false alert where they thought for 40 minutes 
that they were, I mean, the, the Cynthia Lazaroff was talking about, you know, calling her daughter to say goodbye and starting to head for the hills. So this was a very, very scary time when we, you know, when, when it, it, the U.S. pulling out of the Iran deal. And so I think the issue is, is back in a way that it hasn't been. And I think Leslie um, gets at it when she's, you know, she talks about climate change, talk about the pandemic. Those are, these are the issues we need to be talking about. We can't invest in them when we're making the kinds of old fashioned decisions and mindlessly thinking about our security that leads us to places of pulling out of arms control agreements. <laughs> there is an architecture we can build back that allows us to invest in the things we should be investing in and reduce the numbers rather than mindlessly recreate them. And I think we have to, in a sense, tie all these existential threats, not as competing for our attention, but let's get rid of the nuclear one. We know how to do this. We did that from 1970 to 2010. We reduced the arsenals. We got to a place where leaders were saying a nuclear war you know, can never be won and should never be fought. And, and we're leading us in a direction where we could spend less and less time, attention, and resources on them. And they're back. And it's a waste of time and energy because we've got more important things to focus on. But we can't because we can end civilization as we know it within minutes because we've fallen down on this particular job. Right. I mean, look, you know, as we were saying, I mean, this is an election year. And, you know, I mean, if, if it's, we're not, the next three months really are, or the next two and a half months are the most unbelievably crucial because, I mean, how do we get candidates to incorporate this in their platforms and, and to, to raise um, awareness that this is a crucial issue that needs to be linked with the other ones? And also, again, really raise awareness of the, the 1.7 trillion deal that's going to, you know, for a generation. Um, potentially be a part of, of, you know, the direction that our country is, is going in a, a nuclear policy. And um, I mean, it needs to be a presidential issue um, and it needs to be an issue in congressional races as well. Um, again, it's, um, it, it's such a cacophonous environment and there are so many, you know, urgent issues that are, that are competing for attention, but there must be a way for advocates to have candidates include this issue in their in their campaigns right now, right? So this this maybe gets to the next question that I wanted to 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 ask you. And by the way, I'm taking questions from CCGA dot live. Um, so for everybody watching, please um, go on there and put your questions in, and we'll we'll try to get to as many as we can um, in the remaining time. Um, so this this question um, has a little bit of interest because people can also vote for what questions they'd like to have asked. Um, this one. Um, relates to what we've just been talking about, but maybe we can provide some more specifics for the audience here. Um, what actions do you think US citizens can take now to reduce the threat of nuclear weapons ever being used again? So what well, is it typically <laughs> they can do? Yeah, I, did, I mean, I think that really kind of picks up on the last question, but uh, I was told today, um, and you may all know this, uh, we've all been on, on it's been a, a busy day, um, but that Joe Biden came out today as a candidate um, ad saying that uh, he was for uh, extending New START. It's the last remaining arms control agreement between the U.S. and the Russians. This is, I mean, with all of the overlapping ones, this is the last remaining one. We've shredded every other one that we had. He came out today. I think all of us should, first of all, go see that he said that. I was told he said that. Um, we should be retweeting it. We should be sending that to our friends. We should be talking about that. That's important. If we just say ho-hum, why would he say it again if it's not going to get him anything in the election? So I haven't seen it, I'm told, so I'm on a little shaky ground here. But if he did that, and I think he probably did, let's go out and like say that that's important. I think when we hear things from our candidates, um, it's really important to... Um, let them know that we're voting it up, just like your audience is doing kind of on ccga.live. So that's one small thing we could all do today, if I have my story right. 
Yeah, I, I don't think that's a small thing at all. And I think that if, 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 if it is not, if he hasn't indeed said it yet, then he is ur urged to say it. You urge him to say it. You urge your local candidates to urge him to say it. I mean, we are at a moment where we have unprecedented ways because of technology to be in communication with our candidates, with our leaders, and to, you know, to, to show that we are interested and that we actually are, you know, are aware that this is an existential threat and we want to tackle it. We want to address it is important. Um, deadly important, you know, in fact. And so I just think that right now, again, in this in this election moment, that's probably the best thing um, that you can do besides, of course, you know, following the, the bulletin of the atomic scientists on social media and, you know, check getting their newsletter because then you can really remain educated about, um, you know, the state of um, uh, accumulation in nuclear arsenals, uh, the state of uh, treaty withdrawals, you know, what really is happening on the ground in Iran, what is really happening on the ground in North Korea, and, and just to have the best information possible, possible because we haven't really touched on, on this yet in our discussion, but we are um, in, in an atmosphere of unprecedented disinformation right now, and we do have outlets where there is uh, impeccable expert information, and that's one of them. Yep. Great. Um, and when we're talking about the sort of current arms control framework um, and all of the agreements and um, deals that are there that the US appears to be um, pulling out of and all the rest, um, this leads to a, a, another question that's got um, a couple of votes as well. Um, so to what extent does the current arms control framework need an update mm -hmm. to reflect the proliferation environment and changes in global governance over the last 40 years? And Rachel, I think you've pointed out we are in a very different moment now. So, you know, um, how do we need to sort of amend these agreements or is the architecture right for us going forward in the future? Yeah, I think that's one of uh, that. That's the conversation we should be having. Right. We should be having a set of arms control agreement that needs updating rather than just defending, even having them to, uh, to start with. So, for example, let me just I'm going to shift briefly, but it's it's relevant. Uh, the, the World Health Organization many within the World Health Organization believed that there was dysfunctions associated with it and different kinds of investments needed to be made. The U.S. pulling out of it does not allow that to happen. It doesn't make it better. It makes it even worse. And that's very much where we are in arms control right now. So uh, I'll go back to the Iran deal that was very contentious in the United States um, to, to support it or not. And it's an old debate. But there were those who didn't want to sign it because it wasn't good enough. And there were those who had been through a whole history and said, this is the best arms control agreement that we can get and we can build on that. And so this notion of just because it doesn't work, we should get rid of it rather than just because it doesn't work we, means we should invest more time in it. Lyndon Johnson had a great expression for this, which is that it's easier to burn down the outhouse than install plumbing. And I think that's what we've done for arms control. Uh, arms control. We can point to all the weaknesses, and that should charge us up to fill in the holes to make it better. So we've got new technologies coming out um, it's in artificial intelligence and cyber, in in things that are now going to overlap that have to be part of future arms control agreements about how um, how these interplay. We're not even having that conversation because we don't have any arms. We don't have any platform to start at. So having the putting these in place these are all things we need to be addressing but we can't when we're just ripping out any sort of agreement so it's a long answer but there's a very important piece out in politico today signed by fiona hill wrote it uh tom pickering thomas graham where they talk about relations with the russians and they push all of the weaknesses and how prom the u.s and russians still control 90 percent of all nuclear weapons on this planet, and we don't have a strategic dialogue with them anymore. So things, again, we can advocate for. Talking to the Russians is really politically hot right now. No one wants to do it, and yet we must do it. We must talk with our adversaries. Our friends are easy. And so that's another area. We can try to create space for our political leaders to find ways to re-engage with the Russians, even though they're violating borders involved in our elections, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. And, and if we can come back um, for a minute, um, based on the sort of interest in the questions, um, looking at um, Hiroshima uh, again, um, it, there's an interesting question here that I think, you know, it's, it kind of relates to what you were talking about, Leslie, with disinformation as well. 
um, and the current environment we're in today. Can the Hiroshima cover-up happen now um, or again in today's politics, especially since China has expelled US journalists? I think, look, I mean, it would be more complicated to have a cover-up like we saw in 1945 today because of cell phone technology. You know, I mean, people would be able to, they would have been able to broadcast um, videos photographs, um, you know, that is until occupation forces came in and, you know, took care of internet signals. But um, I think cover up is always possible. And, um, you know, a lot of undoing, uh, a lot of investigating cover up, it, it falls to journalists to do the, the first waves of uh, uncovering cover up, and then it's going to fall to historians. And so, for instance, I mean, when you look at, you know, our leadership's treatment, our national leadership's approach to the COVID crisis and how much it seems, and again, this is, you know, my opinion, uh, how much of it seems to have been spun, downplayed, outright denied, uh, you know, with the pandemic de depicted as a hoax. I mean, there's a lot of apparent cover up and who knows, you know, I mean, it will be up to journalists first and historians later to parse what was really going on. Cover up is always possible. Yep. And, and related to Hersey and the sort of reporting as well, again, um, this is actually sort of going back. Um, how do you think Hersey's reporting changed the mood and outlook of US victory at the time? And did this inform future policy or war strategies? Well, I think it definitely sucked the, you know, the confetti out of the air, you know, for sure. Um, I mean, and there, there were, you know, it, was, it wasn't, everybody wasn't, you know, duly chastened by this reporting. There were people who also, you know, read this reporting and they saw Hersey as a propagandist or, um, you know, that they thought he was advocating for them to give, uh, Americans to give their secrets to the Soviets, their nuclear secrets, which, you know, and by this point, the Cold War was was quite underway. Um, and, you know, so, but it did, it did create a sober atmosphere around the anniversary of Hiroshima that hadn't existed before. And when you, <laughs> When Hersey and his editors were about to bring out um, his his reporting, his article, you know, they, they were a little bit late. They missed the first anniversary, and they had been a little bit worried about what their anniversary uh, coverage competitors were going to do. They didn't have to worry. I mean, the 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 reports in Time Magazine or the New York Times was so unbelievably flippant and dismissive about what had happened in Hiroshima. Um, I mean, they there was even a made up item in uh, Time, you know, where it talked about how the uh, survivors in Hiroshima had just, you know, thrown a huge dance and they, they were doing, you know, big fire sales at department stores that didn't exist. I mean, it was really outrageous. And so after Hersey's reporting came out, that was, that was absolutely the end of that. It changed the reporting about what had happened. It changed the national mood about it. And um, your second question, I mean, I actually, I mean, again, I feel that this is something that I'd love to hear Rachel's opinion on, you know, as the historian of subsequent decades, I'm really concentrating very much on the 1940s. But I think, you know, again, what Hersey felt his, uh, what Hersey felt his role had been was in what whatever predominant argument there was that, you know, nuclear weapons were necessary. He attached the image of what nuclear attack looked like. And so you could never again divorce nuclear attack from the images of post-apocalyptic agony. You know, not just the immediate impact, the immediate devastation, but the fact that it, it kills, you know, in the most horrific way possible long after the bomb has been detonated. And so I, I'd say that it's kind of like he affixed a permanent shadow to whatever, you know, official justifications might have been used in the future to deploy nuclear weapons. Um, you know, you know, whether, you know, because, you know, I mean, you, you know, Eisenhower was even considered them, you, you know, use of them at one point because they were cheaper than bringing conventional weapons and, and troops over into to Korea. He always had it as a, as a potential, but you, he never would have been able to use weapons again without the public's full knowledge of what the cost would be like. Well, um, Unfortunately, we have to leave it there. We have a number of other um, great questions and we've had such a rich discussion. I'm sure we could, we could talk for, for much more. Um, but I'd just like to thank you both, Leslie and Rachel, um, for a really terrific, rich conversation um, and uh, letting everybody know that there will be a recording of the program that will be available on the council website. 
YouTube channel and its social media platform shortly. Um, just to remind you, Leslie's new book, Fallout, the Hiroshima cover-up and the recorder who revealed it to the world is available. Thank you, <laughs> for sale. Oh, there we go. Fantastic. <laughs> It's available for sale by the bookseller. So you can go and find a direct link on the event page and um, go and read the book. It's, uh, it's really terrific. Um, and of course, the, um, uh, there'll be a lot of sort of other um, resources for you um, on the council's uh, website. Um, thank you all for joining us on this really important day as we've reflected on Hiroshima um, and the realities of nuclear weapons and the impact of their use. Um, and um, we do hope that you continue to engage with us um, on this important topic and uh, many others. Thank you very much.